Amen. John chapter 7 this morning. John chapter 7. And uh, this morning we're looking at verses 37 through 52. John chapter 7, verses 37 through 52. And the title of my message today is Jesus, the Great Divider. Jesus, the Great Divider. The first church I was a lead pastor at, uh, we had one of the church signs outside, kind of similar to the one that's over here as you come into the parking lot. And, and uh, there was one of the members of the church that took it upon himself to every week put a different saying on the church sign. And some of the weeks, the, the sayings were okay. Some of the quotes were cute. Some of them were funny. Some weeks he put scripture verses out there. And, and then there were some weeks when they were just weird, okay? <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, uh, he's gone on to be with the Lord. I hope and pray that's where he's at. But uh, <laughs> he's gone on to be with the Lord since then. But uh, he would put some signs out. And I'd scratch my head as I'd come into the office like, what does that even mean? And, and so I've come up with an idea this morning, and I want to give you some of my top 10 weirdest church signs that I have seen. Some of them are creative, some of them are funny, but some of them are just kind of weird. Okay, so here they are. Uh, number 10, tweet others as you would like. Put it up there, please. Thank you. Tweet others as you would like to be tweeted. <laughs> number 9. Don't make me come down there. God. This was outside of a Catholic church. How do we make holy water? We boil the hell out of it. Not sure about that one. Next one. Choose the bread of life. I love this one. Or your toast. How about this one? Now is a good time to visit. Our pastor's on vacation. I better never, ever see that on the sign out here. I'm just saying. <laughs> that poor pastor. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> uh. Next one, Adam and Eve. The first people not to read the apple terms and conditions. The next one, Jesus is returning. Resistance is futile. <laughs> All of you Star Wars and Trekkie fans, I guess that fits that. Uh, this one is put out during the summer. Sin burn is prevented by sun, Jesus, screen. <laughs> this one is uh, one that was out not too long ago. God loves you more than Kanye loves Kanye. I guess you have to know who Kanye is for that one to make any sense. <laughs> uh, here's the last one. This was one of my favorite ones outside a Catholic church again. What do you call a sleepwalking nun? A Roman Catholic. Get it? If not, I don't want to explain it. <laughs> anyway, so uh, this morning we have been uh, going through the Gospel of John. We've been looking at the, the fact that the Gospel of John is all about signs. It's about the signs that Jesus performed that showed people who he was and that ultimately led to the greatest sign that he rose again on the third day, to set us free from our sin. And, and John chooses seven significant miracles, called seven signs, and these signs point to the truth of who Jesus is. And today is the fourth and final message in our looking at John chapter 7. And Jesus has been on this uh, journey, he's been at this festival, the Feast of Shelters, the Feast of Tabernacles. And popular perception in the world concerning Jesus at that time was that, that he was kind of a rebel or he was a great teacher. Or he was somebody that, that, that could set the world and the stage for the Israelites back to where they thought he would be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Popular perception in the world concerning Jesus today is kind of the same. We have all kinds of ideas of who Jesus is. Some people think that he came to bring peace. Peace on earth. Peace through love. And we've just sang and celebrated Christmas. And a lot of people think that that's why Jesus came, to bring about that peace. That sort of pop idea about Jesus is reinforced this time of year. We're reminded of how Jesus, the Son of God, was born as a child. A son is given. And the Bible says he shall be called the Prince of Peace. The angels, of course, announced to the shepherds that he would bring peace on earth. And even the Jews had this expectation that when the Messiah came, peace would come through him. 
But Jesus shattered that expectation. Today we see a growing animosity against Jesus. In the day that Jesus, in this passage that we're going to look at, the religious uh, leaders, the religious mafia, so to speak, were outraged because Jesus had jumped up in the middle of the final festival. And wow, that's really weird. The final festival ceremony and shouted to the crowd that he was the source, as we talked about just a little bit ago, the source of living water. So if you'd follow along this morning, John chapter 7, beginning with verse number 37. It says, on the last and great day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Verse 14. Or sorry, verse 40. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he is the Messiah. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand upon him. Verse 45. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Verse 50. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I pray that you would just speak to our hearts. That your word would become alive in us. Lord, that we would hide it in our hearts. That we might not sin against you. And that we might live our life for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. There is no doubt that the people had different opinions about Jesus. The best summary of all these verses in this passage can be found in verse number 43 where it says, So the crowd was divided because of Jesus. The crowd was divided because of who Jesus was, because of who he claimed to be. The people that were gathered around at that time, 2,000 years ago, were divided. And can I tell you today, 2,000 years later, Jesus is still the great divider. He's still one that divides hearts and souls. He's still one that divides our worlds. Have you ever wondered why people are so divided about Jesus? I think as we read this passage of Scripture, we can find three good reasons why people are so divided over who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and who he even claimed to be. Jesus is one that people look at, and they have to grasp the reality and the truth of who he is. And some people just don't want to do that. I think the first reason people are divided is because Jesus divides people because he claims... (laughs) to be the ultimate truth. Jesus claims to be the ultimate truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say I'm the way and part of the truth or a truth. He said, I am the way and the truth. See, the crowd had different opinions about Jesus. Some said he was a prophet predicted by Moses. Others said he was certainly the Messiah. But then there was the group that got hung up on Jesus being from the town of Galilee. Another group said the Messiah has to come out of Bethlehem, not out of Galilee. But we know something that they didn't know. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The idea of Jesus being divisive is hard for most of us to understand. We want to think of Jesus as this great uniter. Jesus as this one that brings everybody together. We remember when Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would all be one just as he and the Father are one. 
There's a lot of verses in the New Testament that speak of having unity in the Spirit. See, when it comes to the body of Christ, the church, there is and should be unity within the body of Christ. There should be unity for all believers, all who have called upon the name of the Lord. We should be in unity one with another. And we are one in Christ. But when it comes to how the world reacts to truth about Jesus, there is always going to be division. When it comes to how the world responds to Jesus, there is always going to be a sense of division. Jesus even predicted that family members would be divided against him. They'd be divided over who he was. Listen to this in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 36. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his households. You see, church, Jesus realized that because of the radical nature of his teaching, that people would always be divided against him. We live today in a, a postmodern age, a day and an age that, that rejects all absolutes. In the spiritual sense, I want to give you a couple simple definitions of what postmodernism really represents. Postmodernism is suspicion toward anyone who claims to have absolute truth because they will say there is no such thing as absolute truth. Most Americans don't believe there is absolute or ultimate truth. See, to them, truth is whatever they believe to be true. Today you hear people say, well, your truth may not be my truth, and my truth may not be your truth. And that's how the world justifies believing and behaving any way other than the Word of God says. And believing and acting any way that they choose because they say, well, this is my truth. This is the truth for me. It may not be the truth for you. But the Word of God tells us that Jesus is the truth. And if we want to live in the truth, we have to live as Christians. We have to live as followers of Jesus Christ. Followers of what the word of God says. John 14, 6, let me read the whole verse there. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Nobody gets to the Father. People are saying, well, there's lots of ways to get to heaven. There's lots of ways to get to God. If you're just good enough or if you do a lot of good things, if you don't do this and don't do that, then you'll be able to get to heaven. Well, you can believe in this God or that God or all these gods together and it will get you to heaven. But Jesus clearly says that that is not the case, that there is only one way to the Father and that is through the truth and the truth is Jesus Christ. Jesus claimed to be truth and the only way to get to heaven. And friends, he is still dividing billions upon billions of people today because he proclaimed to be the truth. In John 17, 17, Jesus said to his father, Lord, your word is truth. In John 8, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you. Oh, you guys know that one. <laughs> and yet we know that verse, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you but yet, how many of us don't follow after the truth? And because we don't follow after the truth, we find ourselves in bondage. We find ourselves in all the chaos of the world. This morning, I want you to understand that the truth about Jesus does divide people. And sadly, it even divides families. Many times, a family member will follow Jesus and other members of the family aren't, that aren't religious or aren't followers of Christ. It will cause conflict in the home. Some of us have family members who make it impossible to talk to about things of faith when the family gets together because they have a twisted idea of what the Bible says or who Jesus says that he is. But church, when it comes to faith in Jesus, Jesus is the great divider. Oh, he unifies the body of Christ, but he divides the world. This morning, I want you to understand this. You cannot be neutral about Jesus. To be neutral is to be against him. You can't be neutral about who Jesus is. Today you have to proclaim that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You can't just say, well, I'm not sure. Because if you're not sure, the Bible says in the end, you forfeited what Christ came to do. And that is to give you life. To bring you into a relationship with God the Father. Jewish leaders sent their temple police, I love this, to arrest Jesus. And in this passage of scripture, we see that they come back empty-handed. <laughs> 
I want you to recognize there's a little bit of humor in this. Try to imagine the anger of the Jewish leaders when the guards come back. These guards were sent to arrest Jesus, and here they come back, and there's no Jesus. I mean, these are the, the, the toughest, the roughest. I mean, how did Jesus escape from them? When they came back, they demanded, where is he? Why didn't you arrest the man Jesus? Can you see the guards? Well, um, well, you see, um, well, um, we went to arrest him. And, and we, were, we had all the intents, and we had, we, had, we had planned to arrest him. But, but then when we got there, we, you know, as we got closer, we could hear him talking. And as he was talking, it's like something in us was just changed. And, and it was interesting what he was saying. It was amazing, the words that he said. And, and, and so we just began to listen to him. Nobody ever taught like he taught before. And so instead of arresting him, well, we decided just to let him go this time. The religious leaders, man, they were not happy. They, they were ticked off, to say the least. <laughs> and they, they replied to the guards, you're a bunch of fools. How could you do this? You have been fooled by a common man. How could you let this happen to you? Do you know the law? Do you know what he's teaching? No, you don't. We know the law. And we know what he's teaching goes against the law. And because of that, the law says he needs to die. Why didn't you bring him to us? You see, these two groups demonstrate that you can't be neutral about Jesus. You can't be neutral. You love him, you hate him, but you can't be in the middle. You can't be in the middle. Matthew 12, 30 says this, anyone who is not with me, Jesus said, is against me. And anyone who does not gather with me scatters. Are you with him? Because if you're not, he says you're against him. If you don't go out and gather with him, you're going to scatter. Someone said this is the most narrow-minded statement that Jesus probably ever made. And it may be true in our current pluralistic, super tolerant American religious mindset. Yet it does sound rather intolerant. How could Jesus say this? If you're not with me, you're against me. Who is he to say that? But it doesn't change the fact that it's true. Can I tell you again? It doesn't change the fact that it's true. Maybe sound intolerant to us today in our day and age, but listen, it is still true today. If you're not with him, you're against him. Jesus says you can't straddle the fence when it comes to him. You're either at this moment trusting him or you're rejecting him. The only thing you can't do is be neutral about Jesus. Are you gathering people toward him or are you pushing people away from him? Are you gathering others around, or are you scattering them far away? I love what C.S. Lewis wrote about this. He said, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Let me say it again. There's no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. C.S. Lewis went on to write this. Jesus... He, he said, you can write Jesus off as a lunatic, or you can attack him as a liar. You can crown him as Lord, but you, the only thing you cannot do is ignore him. You can't ignore him. You can't be neutral. Some nations like Switzerland declare that when it comes to war, they're neutral. But can I tell you, if somebody put a bomb down on Switzerland, all of a sudden they wouldn't be neutral anymore. <laughs> you can only be neutral for so long until you have to decide. Are you for me or against me? People who try to be neutral about Jesus remind me of a man in Kentucky during the Civil War who tried to be neutral. He didn't want to be identified with the rebels, so he wore a dark blue shirt. He didn't want to be identified with the Yankees, so he wore gray trousers. As a result, guess what? He got shot from both sides. Because you can't be neutral. If you're neutral, you're going to get hit from both ends. There's no neutrality when it comes to Jesus Christ. And because of that, here's number two. Expect to be ridiculed when you take a stand for Jesus. Expect to be ridiculed when you take a stand for Jesus Christ. When Nicodemus defended Jesus, they, they turned on him with sarcastic anger. And they mocked him by saying, you're not from Galilee also. You're not from there, are you? Are you really one of them? 
They replied, investigate. Nicodemus, check it out for yourself, and you'll see that no prophet comes from Galilee. But let me tell you, when you actually investigate the scriptures and you dig in, you'll discover that there were actually other prophets that came from Galilee as well. Jonah was from near Galilee. Micah was from Galilee. Elijah was from the Galilee area. And yet these great scholars said, nothing good comes from Galilee. And yet these great prophets before Christ came from there as well. Nicodemus was a Jewish ruler. He came to Jesus at night, if you remember. And Jesus told him that religion was not enough. Just going through the motions, fulfilling law is not enough. Jesus said that if anyone wants to see God's kingdom, they must be born again. If you want to see the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And remember the story, Nicodemus said, wait, whoa, 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 hold on. How can I get back in my mother's womb? How is that even possible? Nicodemus just didn't get it. And some of us might think that as well, how, how could I go back? No, it's not about going back. It's about right where you're at saying, okay, from this point on, I'm going to be born again. I'm going to let my spiritual life be renewed. And that's exactly what happened after the crucifixion. Hope came to all of us, and we could be born again in Jesus Christ. I don't know if Nicodemus ever joined in and became part of the disciples. We're not sure. The Bible doesn't really tell us. But at this point, Nicodemus is standing up for Jesus. And just speaking up for Jesus unleashed the hate of all the members of the Sanhedrin. They accused him of being a Galilean. You, are you from there as well? I mean, what's the opposition? Why why did they look down upon Galilee? I mean, Galilee was a region in the north near the Sea of Galilee. It was considered part of the rural part of Israel. The residents of Jerusalem, they were refined. They were educated. They were the aristocrats of the Jewish society. Those people up from Galilee, you know, they were considered the, the uneducated, the, the backwoods hicks of Israel. The religious leaders couldn't imagine that a prophet, let alone the Messiah, would come from such a backwoods place. So let me just illustrate this by using something that we can relate to here. This is how they looked upon those from Galilee. Did you know that in rural parts of Pennsylvania, they are often called Pennsylvania? Have anybody heard that, Pennsylvania? <laughs> it's because of the large concentration of rednecks. Okay, these are... Areas that are noted for their great interests in hunting, country music, NASCAR, trailer life, Walmart, dollar stores, and just going to work at the plants. Most of these people are often spotted wearing camouflage with full-grown beards and unkept caveman appearances, driving pickup trucks with gun racks, and that's just the women. <laughs> Pennsylvania has the largest rural population of any state. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I looked it up this week. It has the largest rural population of any state. At one time, I actually pastored as a youth pastor in the furthest southwest corner of Pennsylvania called Greene County, where the, the county seat is Waynesburg, Pennsylvania, just below Washington County. And, and Waynesburg, Pennsylvania, in Greene County is known to be the most redneck county in Pennsylvania. And having lived there for four years, I can tell you, Yep, it pretty much was the most redneck county in the states. So, as I lived there, I can tell you this. The next president probably isn't coming from Greene County. The next governor probably isn't coming from... I mean, miracles can happen. We see that Jesus, the miracle, came from Bethlehem. But people in Greene County, can I tell you? They were proud of their redneck ways. <laughs> It's amazing. Rednecks, they get proud. They're proud of who they are. They're proud of their trucks. They're proud of their guns. They're proud of all of that stuff. And, and even though they may be a little bit backwards, whenever you would talk about it, at least they, they, this is what they would say. Well, at least we're not like those hillbillies down in West Virginia. <laughs> Green County borders West Virginia. And honestly, truthfully, the, Green County was redneck as redneck can be. But they'd say, well, we're not like the hillbillies down in West Virginia. Because no matter how low you are, there's always somebody lower on the totem pole. They thought of themselves as being more sophisticated than the West Virginians. You see, everything's relative. A redneck is higher on the social ladder than a hillbilly. And in Israel, the people from the hills of Galilee, they were considered to be the lowest on the lowest ladder. The sophisticated people of Jerusalem considered them 
well, just country folk or the hicks. Kind of like the hillbilly mother who wrote a letter to her son. Listen to this letter she wrote. Dear Billy Bob, I'm writing this letter real slow because I know you can't read very fast. We don't live where we did before because your pa done heard that most accidents happen within 10 miles of your home. So we moved 15 miles away to be safer. I can't send you our new address because the last family who lived here, well, they done did take the numbers off beside the door so they wouldn't have to change their address at their new house. We went shopping yesterday and I locked my keys in the car. We was really worried because it took me two hours to get your pa out of the car. Some exciting news. Your sissy had a new baby. We haven't found out if it's a boy or girl yet, so I don't know if you're an aunt or an uncle. Your uncle Skeeter drowned in Nevada whiskey fa- down at the whiskey factory where he'd been working. Some men tried to fish him out, but he was able to fight him off. They said he died a happy man. We had him cremated, and he burned for three days. I'm sorry. I meant to put a $10 bill in this letter, but I'd done already sealed the envelope when I thought about it. <laughs> Love, Ma. Country folk. Hillbillies. Rednecks. You see, there are many pseudo-sophisticated people in our culture today who believe that Bible-believing Christians are nothing more than hillbillies, rednecks, who just hold to their guns and their Bibles. Well, friends, I can tell you this. In the end, you don't need to hold your gun, but you need to hold your Bible. Because if you're not holding on to the Word of God, you're going to go after everything else that this world says is important. And in the end, everything this world says is important, the Bible says, will vanish. It will be destroyed. But when you're holding on to Jesus, when you're holding on to his word, it will go with you. It will last for eternity. Church, we're witnessing an attack against Christianity and the Bible like never before. Not just in our country, but in this world. The academic community considers us to all be a bunch of hicks from the sticks. The same scorn directed towards Nicodemus is directed towards those of us that stand up for Jesus. There's a strong expression of intellectual snobbery happening in our nation today. Think about this, Harvard, Princeton, Yale. They were all founded as Christian schools. These schools were established to train young men for gospel ministry. But today, if you attend an Ivy League school and claim to be a a believer in creation rather than evolution, you will be ridiculed. You will be laughed to shame from one of these schools that were founded to take people and make them into ministers of the gospel. A lot of intellectuals consider Christians to be ignorant Bible thumpers who just refuse to change with the times. If you claim to believe in the Bible in today's culture, you're going to be labeled as narrow-minded, bigoted, homophobic, anti-intellectual, unscientific. You're going to be labeled as intolerant and probably a lot worse words that I can't even repeat. (laughs) And yet Jesus said this would happen. He said you will be persecuted when you stand up for me. Listen to his words in Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you. Wait a second, what? Yeah. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you. Wait a second, I don't want to be insulted and persecuted. But Jesus says, wait, when you are, blessed are you. Not just for the sake of being persecuted, not just for the sake of being also insulted. But he says, when they say all kinds of evil things about you falsely on account of me. You see, it's not just to be insulted for who you are, to be persecuted because of being the person that you were created to be. But Jesus says, they're going to say all kinds of things against you because you take a stand for me. I love what he says in verse 12. Rejoice and be glad. (laughs) Wait, what? Uh, Jesus, you don't realize what they're doing. They're They're putting me down. They're making fun of me. They're calling me names, and I can't get a job because they think I'm too narrow-minded. He says, rejoice and be glad because your reward is great in heaven. He doesn't say rejoice and be glad because, man, I'm going to pour out everything on earth. You're going to have everything on earth. It'll be great. No, he says, your reward is in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets before in the same way. 
Look back at the Old Testament. Look back at the Old Testament prophets, and you can see that every one of them was persecuted. Every one of them was mocked. Every one of them was put down. And yet their reward was great in heaven. And he says, your reward will be great in heaven as well. The greatest time of persecution against Christians in history is taking place now. Current statistics point out that one out of every nine Christians in the world live in a place where it is forbidden or illegal to publicly practice their Christian faith. Think about that. One out of every nine, they can't even practice their public faith. Most people think that China is probably the worst place to be a Christian. And although it is very dangerous to be a Christian in China, China actually ranks 23rd as the most persecuted place to live as a Christian. The top three are North Korea, Afghanistan, and Somalia. You see, if you're found to be a Christian in one of those three countries, it's not just persecution that you will face. It's almost certain death that will come your way. Don't you dare claim to be a Christian in North Korea. If you do, you won't even have a moment to denounce it because they will just kill you on the spot. Yet believers in these and other greatly persecuted countries, it's amazing. They're not discouraged. Christians in these countries, they're not discouraged because they're seeing God move. They're seeing God do incredible things. They're seeing the Spirit of God moving because they are being faithful to the one. They are standing up for Jesus. And they said if they keep persecuting us, guess what? We'll just keep going underground. And it's been proven that when the church is forced underground, that it grows at an even faster rate. Throughout history, the blood of the martyrs has been the seed of the church. When you look around the world... Look around our city. Look around your family. Listen, Jesus is still the great divider. And yet Jesus is saying, listen, if you take a stand for me, even if you have to go underground, the church will not be stopped. The church will continue to grow because people will come to know me as their Lord and Savior. And nothing can hinder the kingdom of heaven from expanding. When the church, when the men and women, when the followers of Jesus Christ say, I'm not going to back down, I'm not going to back away, I'm going to keep on going forward and lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. We can't give in to what the world is saying. We can't give in to the, the politics of the world. We can't give in to the, 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 the idolatry of the world. We have to hold fast to the truth of who God is and what he's doing in our hearts and in our lives. Jesus wants to move in your heart Jesus wants to move in your life in so, such a powerful way that you recognize, I don't have to back down. That when you go to arrest him, because he doesn't meet up with the standards of the world, that when you go to arrest him, you actually do some investigation. And you realize, nah, the religious leaders, they have it all wrong. Because he does fulfill the law. He fulfills the words of the Old Testament prophets. And if he fulfills all of that, he fulfilled the, the testimony that he'd come as a baby in a manger. If he fulfills that, then truly he fulfilled the fact that he died on a cross. He rose again on the third day for you. And if he fulfilled that, then he's definitely going to fulfill the ultimate one. He's coming back for each and every one that calls upon him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way to get to the Father is through him. Not my words, not the words of this world for sure, but through the words of the truth, Jesus. He's the only way. He's the only way to get to heaven. Worship team, would you come up? Years ago, I traveled with the Continental Singers as a teenager and one of those days, we were driving through the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. And we came to what is known as Independence Pass. Independence Pass is known as the Continental Divide. Geologists call it the backbone of the continent. It's the line running north and south where the mountains reach their highest peaks. This portion of the Continental Divide in the U.S. is about three miles long. It stretches from Montana all the way to the Mexico border. There's an amazing meteorological fact about this ridge. Two drops of rain can be falling side by side. 
If one falls on the western side of the ridge, that, that drop of water will join others and flow westward toward the Pacific Ocean. If the other drop falls on the eastern side of the ridge, it will join others to flow into the Mississippi River, out into the Gulf, and finally into the Atlantic Ocean. There's actually a book written about this. Think about it. Two raindrops. Two raindrops. One summer afternoon, a booming thunder shower sweeps across the high peaks of Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. Two tiny raindrops, rainy and splash, fall through the stormy sky, coming to a gentle landing on two sides of the high ridge called the Continental Divide. In an instant, gravity pulls the two raindrops in different directions, sending them across on a cross-country journey to separate oceans. These two raindrops were so close as they fell through the sky that they were almost clinging to each other. And even though they started out the same place, they'll end up oceans away from each other. People are the same way. You see, belief in Jesus isn't the continental divide, but it is the eternal divide. Either you know him or you don't. Either you're for him or you're against him. You see, two people can be sitting side by side here in this church service this morning, hearing the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. One has accepted Christ and goes to heaven, and the other person rejects the gift of God, of eternal life. And the Bible says they spend eternity away from God. Sadly, I've seen it happen in families, in marriages, among close friends. It's amazing how people respond differently to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Someone once said, the sun that melts the ice also hardens the clay. The same sun, the son of God that softens our hearts, can also harden the heart that rejects. Which side of the divide are you on today? Which side are you on? Can you say, I've repented of my sin and placed my faith in Jesus Christ? I'm going to follow Jesus regardless of how I'm persecuted or how I'm scorned. I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what the culture around me is doing or saying. Today I choose to be on the right side of salvation. Because if you're on the wrong side and you never change, the Bible says your destiny will be spent in eternity separated from God in a place that the Bible calls hell. It's not some man-made place. It's not some fictional place. No, God tells us in his word that there is a place called hell. And for those that don't call upon the name of Jesus, for those that don't believe in him, they're condemned to that place. But to anyone that calls upon the name of Jesus, they'll be saved. They'll be saved. See, friends, it's not too late. Right now, you can step across to the line of faith. You can turn your back on sin, and you can trust in Jesus. You can say, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And that means you'll keep going and going and going until eternity. Friends, the truth is that Jesus divides. But when you surrender to him, when you surrender to him, when you give in to the truth of who Jesus is, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, guess what happens? You're united with other members of the family of God. Oh, it may divide the earthly families, but we're united with the family of God. And what happens when we're united with the family of God? We are there to encourage. We're there to lift one another up. We're there to worship and praise the King of kings and the Lord of lords together. And as we do that, it spurs us on. It encourages us to continue forward in this life, knowing that this is not our final home, but heaven awaits. Heaven awaits those who call upon the name of Jesus. And suddenly, the God who created you, The God who gave you life 
says, now you have eternal life. Because you believed on my one and only son, you now have eternal life. Which side of the divide are you on this morning? Those that are watching on Facebook, which side of the divide are you on this morning? Because it is a divide. Do you know Jesus? Have you accepted him? Have you believed on him as your savior? If you have, then you're going to flow toward the current of heaven. (laughs) But if you've rejected, you're going to flow towards the current of hell. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Just bow your head for a moment. Just ask yourself that question today. Which side of the divide am I on? Which side of the eternity divide am I on? Do I know that I'm going to heaven because I have a relationship with Jesus? Or just by being neutral, have I chosen to go the way of hell? Although he's the great divider... (laughs) He's the one that unifies us. He's the one that reconciles us back to the Father. And it's very simple. Just believe in him today. Just believe the truth of his word today. Just right where you're at, just ask him to come in. Jesus, come into my heart today. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for living for my own selfish desires. Forgive me for going the way of the world. Today I choose life. Today I choose to be for you, Lord, not against you. Into our heart, Lord Jesus. Come into our heart today. Come in to stay. That beautiful song is just ringing in my heart right now. Lord, come into my life, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. Thank you, Jesus. For some of you, you just need to... you've, You've lived for Jesus. You know Him as your Savior. I'm not sure who this is for, but... Probably for all of us. You feel the tugging of the world. You feel the tugging of maybe friends or families trying to say, hey, you know what? Come this way. But today you need to resolve to say, no, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to hold true and fast to Jesus. I'm going to hold true and fast to the one who saved me. This world's not my home. (laughs) It's rough, yes. It's persecution, yes. But I'm going to hold true and I know that one day I'll see my Savior. I'll be with my God. Today I trust in you, Jesus. Bless your name. It's not easy. And that's why Jesus said if, when he went to heaven, if I go, uh, I go to prepare a place, I will send the Holy Spirit. Some of you just need to be filled with the Spirit today. <laughs> you just need to be filled with the Spirit. You've got Jesus. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's living inside of you, but he wants to fill you up. Like we talked about a couple weeks ago, to overflow in the things of God. So Holy Spirit, come and fill us today. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your power. Fill us, Lord, we pray. In you, O Jesus, do we put our hope and our trust. Bless your name, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can we stand in this place? We're just going to sing and close and praise and worship. And I want you to know these altars are open. Maybe you just need to come and find a place at this altar A place of recommitment, a place of dedication, a place of saying, listen, I'm giving it all to Jesus today. (laughs) 
no matter what else comes my way, I'm going to trust in him. Can we join in in singing this song? We're going to sing two songs this morning. And I just want to encourage you, just stick, stick around. Let's worship him this morning. No need to rush out. It's still a little bit early. And I did that so we could just worship and praise him as a church together. Sing it higher than the mountains. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
your love is faithful, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Can we sing this out this morning? Because Jesus came to touch us, to set us free, and to give us life. Hallelujah. start it because I ain't got a clue. Touch me. Father, we're thankful this morning that you came, <laughs> that you're alive, and Lord, that you came to set us free, and today we can walk in that hope. We can walk in the truth, for you are the truth. 
So, Lord, as we go from this place, may we go out knowing that your way is the only way, that your way leads to life eternal. Lord, let it be so ingrained in us. Let it flow from within us that other people might come to know you as their Lord and Savior, that they might walk in that truth as well. So, Father, we give you the praise. We give you all the glory, for it's in you that we live and move and have our being. In Jesus' name, amen.